Thank you, Cricky. So uh, yes, my name is Michael Shudlowski. Uh, I work at Google. I teach computer science at NYU. Uh, at Google, for the last eight years, I've been uh, on the Google Sheets team. So anyone here not used a Google spreadsheet? I encourage you to try it, OK? All right, maybe afterwards we'll have a beer. I can show it to you. Or maybe not, we'll see. Um, so uh, I'm really excited about this talk. This uh, brings together two worlds that I care a lot about. Um, and uh, I think over the years it's become pretty clear that ethics is playing a bigger and bigger role in technology. And as software engineers, it's my personal opinion that we should be playing a more active role uh, in, in uh, sort of par at least participating in the conversations around ethics and technology since we are often the ones who end up building these systems, maintaining them, putting them into place, and so on. Um, so I'm going to walk you through uh, some ideas that I have today around philosophy. I've been studying this for many years. Um, this talk is not a technical talk. Uh, I will bring in stories from Google uh, where they're applicable. Um, this is a talk that uh, is actually many of the things that I'll talk about today are applicable outside of technology, as ethics is. Um, but, uh, but I will try to marry the two as best I can. If you have any questions as I go along, please just raise your hands, interrupt me, ask the questions. Uh, it's fine. So I think we already, this, this slide I think is kind of almost unnecessary, but it anchors us in a conversation. So the question of why it is that software engineers care about ethics, it's pretty clear. Uh, 30 years ago, the type of software that we were writing, it, it didn't really um, intersect with, with uh, issues of ethics and morality as much as it does today, um, simply because software is ubiquitous and because it's, uh, we're, we're granting control uh, more and more to software. To the point where sometimes we don't even understand how it is that the software has made a decision on our behalf. We don't even know how it came to the conclusion that it came to. We've trained it a certain way and then we've said, well, it usually comes up with pretty good answers. And then when it comes up with an answer that we really don't like or is dangerous or we find distasteful, uh, even the software engineers who built it uh, are sometimes left wondering, I don't know how it did that and I'm sorry. Um, and we'll try to do better. Uh, so some of the issues that we've dealt with recently uh, use, you know, you, you all know about these uh, user privacy, encrypting user data, uh, self-driving cars, obviously. So fake news is a more recent one, whether or not we feel any sort of responsibility for identifying uh, sources of media and trying to characterize them in some way. Uh, this one is particularly interesting, uh, fake news, because I think that Mark Zuckerberg's initial reaction to it reflects a culture that we have as software engineers, and I felt that uh, that was being transferred over uh, into a field that was a little bit different. So um, in software, we feel that all information sort of should be treated equally, everything should be open, everything should flow freely, and it turns out that with, uh, with something like Facebook, uh, you have constraints. You can't let all the information flow in because human beings can't consume that amount of information, so you have to make choices. And when you make the choices uh, based on certain uh, algorithms, you might come up with uh, results that you don't like. And by throwing our hands up and saying, well, we didn't really make a choice, we just picked something based on clicks or, 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 uh, or uh, you know, whatever it was most likely to, uh, however many eyes we thought uh, would respond to it, um, I think we are uh, taking an approach that uh, we believe works in software engineering and has worked for us in software engineering and applying it in the product design in, in, in the social media. Other, actually, one other uh, very interesting item which has to do with uh, encrypting user data was the iPhone. I think, I don't know how many of you remember, a couple of years ago, Apple was asked to hack uh, one of its own phones. The FBI wanted help. Uh, they ended up not doing it. They found a third party. Um, but this was a really uh, interesting question, I thought. And I don't know what many of you uh, would have done in that situation. Or how many of you would have even felt that you had a right to say whether or not you, let's say you worked at Apple. Would you have felt that you had a responsibility to say yes or no, to actually think that through? Or would you have said, well, that's not my job. My job is to build the system or to write the program that's going to reverse engineer this phone. Um, my uh, argument to you is that you should participate in those conversations and that you should feel entitled to. Um, but you need some more information before you can do that effectively. So first, 
I want to propose to you this idea that we can all do ethics. And when I say that ethics is language and not calculus, I mean something uh, very specific. Um, a child learns to speak. A child does not study grammar to learn how to speak. Linguists investigate language. Right? They, it's, it's, it's a hard problem. It's still unsolved. We're trying to figure out how language works. But it turns out to, under, to use language, you don't need to know anything. It's really easy. In fact, it's almost impossible to find anyone who doesn't know how to speak. Even the, the stupidest person in the world knows language. Uh, calculus doesn't work that way. You actually have to go and study calculus. So in my view, ethics is like language. We all uh, participate in, in, in this process of thinking about ethical choices all day long. Some of them aren't as important as what to do when you're designing a self-driving car, but you know, you might get angry on the subway because someone's not giving up a seat. That is based on some calculus of what's right and wrong, and we do that all the time. And in fact, there's a lab at Yale called the Baby Lab where they have babies less than a year old, and they, they play out uh, plays with puppets, bunny rabbits. And they have one bunny rabbit sort of try to open a box, and another one just keep shutting it over, like keep closing it, with sort of the, the really unhelpful bunny. And then afterwards, they bring the bunnies out to the kids, and the good bunny has one cookie, and the bad bunny offers two cookies. And 70% of the kids take the one cookie from the good bunny. They reject the bad bunny. So uh, kids understand. They have some sense of fairness, at least. That's not full-blown ethics. Uh, and one thing that's interesting is uh, I spent a long time studying uh, Immanuel Kant, and one of his big things is, uh, and we'll get to him later, but um, it's, it's that uh, he believes that everything that we do should be universalizable, which is that, well, if it's right for me, it should be right for everyone. And his project is actually really interesting. He, um, you know, it's sort of a variation of do unto others as you would have done unto you, but Kant doesn't really like uh, the idea that it's just a religious argument. So his whole project was, or in part, was to reformulate these, uh, these uh, what he calls categorical imperatives, uh, which are just rules, like Ten Commandments. Like, you, you, all, you never lie, uh, you never kill, you never do whatever. So he wanted to come up with a set of rules, but he didn't want it to be grounded in something as arbitrary as religion. He wanted it to be grounded in reason. And so, for instance, uh, he attacks the problem of lying. He says that lying is abhorrent, you should never, ever lie. Uh, and so you might ask why, and you might say, well, if I lie, uh, it's wrong because I don't expect other people to lie, and so on and so forth. But what he does is he says that lying actually undoes itself. It's not valid in the following way. If you assume that it has to be universalizable, well, if I lie, and everyone can lie, then lying actually doesn't exist anymore. In the same way that if I said to you that Stephen King is lying to me, you'd be confused. You'd say, that doesn't make sense. You're reading fiction. You wouldn't call it a lie. But you wouldn't call it truth. What is it? It doesn't make any sense in that context. So he does the same thing. So he comes up for, as in that particular example, he says lying doesn't work. Not because there's some being that says that you can't do it, but because it just undoes itself as a logical idea if we all do it. Lying just doesn't exist anymore. And so the reason I'm bringing this up now is because I spent all this time trying to understand these concepts. And then um, this idea of universalizability, it turns out, <laughs> Not only do we understand it implicitly, but uh, let me show you a video if I can get my... Okay, so these are two monkeys in an experiment about fairness. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now. Yes, again, the cucumber. You know, you spend months reading philosophy, and then all of a sudden you realize monkeys understand the thing that you're kind of trying to understand. Um, so, uh, so 
The point is we can all do ethics. We all do ethics. Uh, there's a bigger problem of investigating how it is that we make the choices that we make. Why it is that a certain decision feels right and a certain decision feels wrong. Um, but we know that we can make these decisions and that we generally have a, we're pretty good at it for the most part. Um, so my next proposition to you, unfortunately, is that reasonable decisions are not ethical decisions. There's, there's a big difference. Uh, if you are like me, then you maybe are comforted by the fact that you've spent many years of your life studying and being a well-educated person, and you think, well, that's going to help me make good choices in my life. And I propose to you that that's actually not so true. Uh, reason and logic uh, don't really have all that much to do with ethics. So uh, just to be specific about it, the definition of reason, it's the power of the mind to think, understand, and form judgments by a process of logic. And then, of course, logic. It's reasoning conducted or assessed according to strict principles of validity. So we're programmers, many of us. Validity, I love validity. When things are valid, when that program compiles, even before I've run it, it feels good. And generally, that's how a lot of us make the decisions that we make throughout the course of the day. We come to a decision, and then we employ reason as an advocate. We work our way backwards from the decision, developing a line of reason, logic, that creates a set of statements that each one flows uh, systematically from the next. So you can come up with an argument that's very logical and not ethical. You can come up with an argument that's ethical and not logical. Uh, so uh, I'll give you examples. Uh, imagine that you work at Facebook. I don't know. Uh, and you have a goal. Your goal is to maximize the amount of time that users spend on your website. And you understand, you, you do some research, you understand, for instance, that the way to get someone to be most addicted to something uh, is to reward them, not every time they, let's say, pull a lever on a slot machine or check their email or whatever it is, but a variable reward schedule, it turns out, is the most addictive way to do it. So sometimes you give them stuff, sometimes you don't. And it turns out that of all the different schedules of reward, that's the one that once you stop giving them things, they will continue to come back and try to get more things for the longest amount of time if you use that reward scheme. So you say, great, so I've done my research and I've got that. And you also know that clickbait works. So you decide uh, what you're going to do is uh, your goal is to maximize the amount of time that users spend on your website. Uh, you understand that variable reward scheduling is very effective, so you employ that. Uh, and you flood feeds with clickbait. Is anything I just said to you illogical? Is it unreasonable? It makes sense. Is it ethical? That depends. I don't know. But it's a question. I think that you wouldn't say it's a slam dunk ethical, at least. Now, let's say I said to you, uh, same thing. My goal is to maximize user presence on my website. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to automatically log them off uh, after 15 minutes and not allow them to log on again until the next day. Is that logical? That makes no sense. That is an illogical set of statements. One does not flow from the other logically. You're just kind of confused. Uh, you probably just think I'm stupid. Uh, so that's, that's the difference. Now, is it ethical? I, I, I don't know. It's not ethical or not ethical, really, in that case. Um, so, so the problem of employing reason is an interesting one, because philosophers for a long time have debated whether reason should be the slave of passion or passion is the slave of reason and what you should do. And my argument is that you can use reason uh, to either back up an arbitrary argument or to understand the arguments that you, that you put forth uh, for, for validity and to sort of say, well, I'm going to start from a set of principles that make sense to me and then work my way from them. Incidentally, uh, there was an article, I'm sorry, this, this is a little bit of a bummer article, but it's, it's I think, important, uh, this point about education. There was an article in the New York Times in 2005, it's called The Madrasa Myth, and they went back and they studied uh, 75 of the uh, terrorists who were responsible for the most recent large-scale terrorist attacks, including 9-11. And it turns out that the majority of them were college educated. And a number of them either had or were pursuing PhDs. And they were Western college educated. So again, the idea that education is uh, some sort of inoculation uh, for making poor ethical choices, I think there's, there's not a lot of evidence that that's true. So then what do we do? We feel kind of stuck. Well, I kind of said this before, but reason should serve your ethical framework, and the process of coming up with an ethical framework is a separate exercise. That also employs reason, but it's different. Uh, and and uh, reason should not be the thing that serves your arbitrary whim, right? It should serve an ethical framework that you have actually spent time 
putting together thoughtfully, uh, and that's based on a set of um, uh, principles. So this I present to you, since many of you are engineers, uh, this is what philosophers do. This is what they've been doing for 2,000 years. Uh, and it's, it's kind of astonishing that they keep doing this, uh, and they're still arguing about it. Um, but the idea is, if you want to come up with your moral framework, uh, if you're starting from scratch, well, you start with a set of, I have no principles at all. And you say, well, let me look at a moral dilemma. Let me decide what I would do in that dilemma. OK, well, I have a feeling that I would do x. Then I would derive a principle from that. I would take that principle and say, I'll assume that that principle is true, but I'm going to modify now the thought experiment or the circumstance, or take a completely different circumstance, and see if that principle still holds. Because in that circumstance, I will also have a feeling about what's right and wrong. Now, I may have a problem. Because in the second circumstance, as I loop through this multiple times, every time I come to a new situation and I come to a decision, I have to test my principle against that decision. And if they collide, I have cognitive dissonance. I need to resolve it. And I can resolve it in two ways. One way is I can say, well, that's I, actually, the, I thought I should do x, but be, based on this principle I have, really I should do y. So that's what I should do. I made, I made the wrong choice. Or you say, oh, hold on. This principle that I developed for this other, other situation doesn't really make sense in this situation. Whoops. Let me see if I can tweak the principle. Or notice, well, it's a set. So I can add a principle uh, as long as it's consistent with the other principles. And you sort of develop a framework. And a number of philosophers have developed different frameworks. Uh, and this is a way to develop a framework uh, as a software engineer, as an organization, for principles that are important to you and against which you can test choices that you're making in your engineering efforts or in your product efforts. So uh, let's do this. Actually, let's have some fun with this for a second. Uh, if you, uh, those of you who have ever taken a Philosophy 101 class, I apologize if you've done this before. But the thought experiment is the following. You are the conductor of a trolley. You heard it? <laughs> you know it. You're a conductor of a trolley. The, con the trolley is out of control. All right. <laughs> so we'll do it fast. Uh, you've got the five people who are tied up at the end of the tracks. Uh, you, uh, you're the conductor. And you have a choice. You can turn the trolley off to a sidetrack. But of course, tied to the sidetrack, as many of you know, is another helpless victim. Uh, so there's the one victim on the side, the five directly ahead of you. If you do nothing, presumably you'll kill the five. Uh, if you turn the trolley, uh, you'll kill the one. So just show of hands, how many of you believe uh, that you would actually turn the trolley? Uh, kill the one, save the five. OK, it looks like a majority. All right, there's a variation on it. That, and, and again, for those of you who know it, now you're not the conductor. Actually, let me pause, because I didn't, I didn't actually adhere to my algorithm. Why did you turn the trolley? What's the principle? You had a notice that you didn't probably start with your ethical framework. You had a gut feeling, right? And some of you had one gut feeling, and some of you had a different gut feeling. And actually, it turns out that you can easily manipulate people's gut feelings. A lot of behavioral science is really interesting about this. But anyway, we'll leave that aside. And we'll say, you have a gut feeling. What's the principle that backs up that gut feeling? Does anyone want to tell me why you would turn the trolley? Sure. Life is important. Life is important. Numerically important. Yeah, numerically. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's quantifiable in a way. Five lives versus one life. Right? So we always, so principle, always save more lives. Yes, if you can. Perfect. OK. So uh, second scenario is you're not the conductor anymore. You're now. You come upon the tracks. You're walking along. You see the trolley. It's out of control. I don't know. Somehow you can tell the conductor is not there. You can pull a lever on the side of the tracks, turning the trolley off, killing the one, saving the five. How many of you would turn the trolley, uh, not being the conductor this time, but being a bystander? Please let me know. Raise your hands if you would. Still save the five. OK. Same principle applies, I imagine. Did anyone change his or her mind? Why? As OK, so that's an additional principle you might now incorporate. You might say, well, I save f I, numbers matter. Always save more lives. Where I, am, where I have signed, I have some sense of duty uh, in that, in that uh, exchange or in that circumstance. If, I, if, I wasn't, if I'm not responsible for anything that's going on, I, I say that's not my problem, essentially. Sorry, I'm paraphrasing now and maybe making it sound worse than it was. But it's some, is it something like that, basically? Or do you have a different principle? That sounds better than what I said. <laughs> All right, so we'll stick with that. Uh, now there's the third variation. I really like this variation, is that you are, you are uh, you're no longer 
uh, in the trolley, you're no longer a bystander, but you're walking home from work, you're on an overpass over the tracks, and you look down the tracks, you see the trolley coming, you look the other way, you see the five people, and there's no, there's no sidetrack this time, but right next to you on the footbridge, is the trolley is not that big, and next to you is a very, very fat man. And, yeah, some of you are getting really uncomfortable because, yes, it occurs to you that you can shove this man off the footbridge in the way of the trolley, stopping the trolley, saving the deaths, but killing the one. Now, and this is a safe place, how many of you would push the person to his death to save the five? Okay. So... <laughs> okay, but... Here's the, thing about, here's the thing about thought experiments. Hold on, before, you, I, I said it was a safe place. Don't make me a liar. This is, this is the thing about thought experiments. You cannot assume externalities that are not part of the thought experiment. The person is fat for the purposes of this thought experiment only because we need someone sufficiently fat to stop the trolley. It implies nothing about the person's health. The person might be total, uh, incredibly healthy. In fact, the, you can, so what we would do then to test your hypothesis is we would make the five people really unhealthy. And see, and see, right? So this is, this is what you do. You say, wait a minute, I'm making assumptions. Let me change the circumstances and see if my presumptions hold. Now, those of you who wouldn't, most of you said, have changed your mind. You, you're not going to shove someone to his death to stop the trolley. That's murder. Why is it murder? Why is that murder but not turning a trolley that would not have killed someone onto a track and killing them? Why is that not murder? Mm. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, you're pushing someone in front of a trolley. You know it's going to hit them. Okay. And you know when it hits them, what's, there's a very high degree of probability that X, Y, and Z result will materialize. Okay, okay. Is there, is there, that, so that's, that's an interesting part of it. So you have some definition of murder that would play into your principles, and you say, well, I would do all these things, and I want to save more lives uh, if I can, uh, but I will never commit murder. So that's not kind of a line that you will never cross. Uh, yes? Uh, but I feel like if you let those five people die um, and not push the guy, instead by not doing anything, you're equally as guilty of murder because you could have stopped them. Hmm. Okay. Any other? Yes, good. Well, I think that like moving forward, if you take direct action to kill one person, then you're not going to be haunted by the idea that you have killed five people by circumstance. Mm -hmm. And where, <clears throat> so if you take that action, then your future is not further corrupted. So the haunting is an interesting idea. Is anyone here uncomfortable with the proximity of that last scenario compared to the a slight removal of I'm controlling a train that's on tracks that's going to kill someone versus I'm looking into someone's eyes as I push them off and so forth. Uh, yes? Why did what? I don't know. For the purpose of this thought experiment, let's assume he was looking elsewhere. Or if you really want to, you know, well, okay. I, I, there are other variations we can make that would make it impossible for him to have known. But, I, but that's, yes? I feel like you, can't, you also can't be certain that pushing the guy is going to stop the trolley. So you might be killing six people instead of six. Yes. I know. And this is, this is a particularly tough one for that reason because it's a little bit hard to exactly imagine. And a lot of thought experiments people object to because they, they say, well, that's never going to exactly happen that way. There's always, well, couldn't I come up with some other? Can I call the cops? Can I do something else? Um, and, and the whole point of a thought experiment is to make it impossible to, to live in that gray area so that we can try to identify exactly what it is that's motivating us. So you're, you're right, um, but for the sake of uh, whatever you need to do in, in your mental model of the situation, to imagine a person that's sufficiently big and a trolley that's sufficiently small, do that uh, and, and see still if, if you change your mind. Now I have a question for the people who said, and I'm sorry to call you out, but who would push the person off. Can you raise your hands again? Because I have a variation for you. OK, great. So for, so, so for you, and actually for everyone, but I, I, I like, uh, it occurred to me one day when I was thinking about these scenarios, we all believe that we're good people. 
So it's sort of, there are situations that we're more comfortable uh, in, and uh, their decisions we're more comfortable with, their decisions we're less comfortable with, um, but you sort of always assume that you're a good person. Um, imagine that you are at home and your spouse comes home from work, and your spouse says to you, you know, your spouse walks in, you go, oh, well, it's good to see you, how's your day? And the spouse says, the craziest thing happened to me on the walk home. I go, what? Well, uh, you know that footbridge I always cross over on the, way, on the way home from work? Well, I was crossing over, and it's crazy. There were these five people. They were tied to the tracks, and there was this trolley. Oh, my God, it was so crazy. And thank God I was there, because there was this fat man. And I just shoved him <laughs> right in front of the trolley. Oh, thank God, and I saved those people's lives. And you're sleeping next to this person at night. <laughs> now, my question for you is, would that give you pause? It would give, yes. No? no? OK. So during the Nuremberg trials, everyone said, they made me do it. You know, I couldn't. It was either my family, my life. I expect my family to understand that I would sacrifice you for the greater good. I would not do something just because some harm would have happened to me or some harm would happen to my family. I think in a world mm -hmm. where everyone lives under the principle that all lives matter, okay. that, yeah, I understand why you did that. OK. I have yet another thought experiment for you in a second. Yes? What if, what if the, some of the people at the Nuremberg trials were like, well, we were doing this for the good of the majority. We were sacrificing the minority. So you're doing, so, and, I, and before this conversation gets too heated, <laughs> people, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a trick we use to bring in very emotionally charged scenarios into an ethical debate. But it's not an unfair trick. It just, it just means that you need to, um, you need to uh, be careful that you continue to follow the algorithm, which is to say the reason it's important to bring in, let's say, the Nuremberg trials is not, is not because you want to bring in this, this really emotionally charged thing to prove your point, but that it might be a good test of the principle. Right? So I think when you're working through this, it's important that you stay true to that. Otherwise, you just end up yelling at each other. Um, and you end up falling back into the pattern that I described before, which is that you anchor yourself in a position and you try to work your way back from it because you feel attacked and as soon as you're attacked, you garner your forces of reason and logic and intellect in defense of your position. And that's not what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do is to collaboratively come up with a set of principles that work for the types of decisions that you feel are right or wrong. So, yes, in the back. Yeah. Yeah, and actually where I thought you were going, so, so the trust on, as, as the victim, uh, in this case someone who's tied to the track and you sort of know what, presumably you got into that situation for some, we're not participating in that part of the thought experiment, so somehow you got into the situation that we have nothing to do with. And yes, the, so for many people, the idea that someone was just taking a leisurely stroll on a footbridge and was murdered versus I somehow got myself into a predicament where I got tied to train tracks and now I'm getting murdered is different. But I also uh, actually thought that you were going to go in a different direction with regard to trust, which is that um, for many people, and myself, the reason I uh, brought up the example of a spouse or a partner uh, who comes home from work is that um, uh, for many of us, I think we want to believe that there are certain um, uh, unconditional uh, uh, that, that I know that no set of circumstances will lead to my partner murdering me in my sleep. Like there's no, there's no like, oh, I would have never murdered you in your sleep except X, Y, Z happened, and then I murdered you in your sleep. <laughs> That's something I don't want. And so there might be an illusion, but I mean, some, some, some people might believe there's always a, some scenario you can come up with that that's not going to hold for, but I like to believe that that's actually true. It helps me sleep at night. Um, and so I thought the trust is on both sides. It, it can be the trust of the person, uh, of us as the, as the potential murderers, and also of, of the victim. Um, was there another comment before I present yet another variation? Yes.
that means no variations happen. But because you make the variations, that one person that wasn't supposed to die died. So then, so what is the principle then that that that, that intuition guides you to to can you articulate a principle that you would want to include? Well, what I would call it is just depending on whether you like to play God or you or or you find it distasteful to play God. I don't know. <laughs> Right. Whereas if you left those five to die, you can't kill anyone. Yeah. So uh, one thing that your your um, your comment brings to mind for me is that if you if you take the the Ten Commandments uh, as inviolable, then in fact you wouldn't turn the trolley. I believe. I don't know. Um, uh, because because um, you. If you don't do anything, presumably there's an argument that you're not murdering the five. There's just a circumstance, and that's what's happening. But if you turn, you're killing one. And you might say, well, thou shalt not kill is an inviolable thing. I can never, ever do that no matter what, and I just, uh, and I just hold to that. So maybe that, you know, that, that idea that I can't play God no matter what um, might be a principle that you throw in. I'm not, saying, uh, I'm not arguing for or against it. I'm just showing you how this process works. Um, I'm going to show you. I'm going to move us ahead. Uh, to one more thought experiment, because we still haven't gotten, I think, at the additional principle. We still have the five lives and the one life, and we've gotten some notions of fairness and some notions of innocence. Um, but uh, imagine that you're a surgeon, and you have five patients. Each of them is dying. They're suffering each uh, from an organ failure of a different organ. And in walks a perfectly healthy adult. And it occurs to you because you're a lunatic, that you can murder this person, harvest the five organs, and save the five victims, the, the, fi the, the, the five patients, sorry. So um, anyone here? Any, surgeon, any potential surgeons here? Gonna, you're going you're gonna to murder the one? So I don't know the answer. That's a big question. I can't. I don't know if I can answer that right now. But um, but I but I think it's very rare, extremely rare that that I find um, uh, people are comfortable with that. Is anyone here? Was anyone here willing to shove the person off the off the footbridge, but unwilling to to you know take a scalpel and murder someone for you were? Okay. What was the what was the difference? Okay. Um, let's see. I think, well, my partner was for proximity, so. Okay. Proximity. I think also. Yeah. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, Your hands are dirtier when you're, when, yeah, yeah as the cool. surgeon for sure. The variations were. They're getting closer and closer and closer. Oh. Oh. There's like a bigger time. There's a bigger time involvement with the person. That's mm -hmm. This is a drawn out. Interesting. Okay, we can come up with probably increasingly gruesome thought experiments that involve a trolley and things taking time, but we're not going to. Yes? Um, so I'm one that would do all three and I would be the surgeon. You, you would murder, as the surgeon, you would murder the person. Okay. Okay. Yep. Then what was their original principle? It wasn't then, like we all agreed to, that the, the lives, lives right. Than so, um, yeah, that's, that's a great point. So, so do, do any of you have an answer? And, no, I have an Yep, okay. In this case, the, what was most interesting to me was that there was a tie closer to identity. So, for example, the surgeon, as a person who developed a lifetime of expertise and maybe has some insight.
Mm. Is Okay. Yeah. I, I, these are all, wait, I need to do a time check. How, how much more time do we? Okay. So, so uh, I'm sorry. I, I know I, I actually really want to hear what all of you have to say about this. Um, but I will tell you that if we continue this conversation, it took about 1900 years for philosophers to come upon an idea that we haven't come upon yet, which is not surprising, but the notion of rights. So very often, uh, what, you, what you end up uh, realizing is that you have this notion of some, some lives being worth more than others, but you also have a notion of rights. The violation of rights, the violation of someone's body, uh, the using of a, of a human being as a means of something else as opposed to them just being, uh, you know, the one on the track is not uh, being used for any other purpose. It's just by turning it off, the person dies. There are variations of the trolley problem where the tracks turn around and come back to the five, uh, whereas now the one person is kind of stopping the trolley also, and people feel very uncomfortable about that. Uh, and the same thing with the surgeon, the idea that I'm using another person. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not treating that person with dignity. Uh, and what does dignity mean, and what kind of rights do we have as we walk around innocently on a footbridge, uh, and suddenly you violate my rights uh, in a way that some of the other examples uh, you might not have. So there are lots of other things that will come up as we continue this conversation. But I want to make two points clear. One is you came to ethical decisions very quickly. And then we really struggled to understand why we, can't, we came to the decisions that we did. And the, the, and the arguments that some of us had for why we did something sounded completely uh, unreasonable to, to others. Um, and I think uh, this is exactly why it's so important to do this as if you're in an engineering group, if you're part of an organization, it is, I think, very important to try to understand what values you stand for and what, what's important for you. Um, I'll tell you a quick story at Google, um, because it is relevant here. Uh, if you're, if you're uh, planning your quarter and you're deciding on the features that you're going to work on, you have a certain number of engineers, you have a long list of features, endless, and you say, well, uh, let's, on what basis do we decide the features that we want to build? Maybe you say, uh, the, the, the features that are being demanded by the greatest number of users are the features that we build. Reasonable? Everyone okay with that? Sounds good. All right. Uh, quarter after quarter moves along, and it turns out um, this was one of my projects at Google on Google Sheets many years ago. Uh, my project was to make Google Sheets uh, accessible uh, to those who needed screen readers, who were blind, who needed Braille readers, things like that. And one of the things uh, that's important in this example is the percentage of our users uh, that accounted for, for you know, that had those needs were, were pretty small. There were other features that were uh, that a, a much greater percentage of our users would have used than uh, accessibility uh, accessibility features. Uh, so, so this problem arises of on what basis do we decide then that we should spend engineering time making our product accessible? or perhaps internationalizable. But in, in the case of, of my project, well, I did both, but this, this story is about accessibility. And, um, and uh, we ended up doing accessibility, and uh, I can tell you it was not an easy project. We actually uh, found uh, that the approach we took uh, didn't feel convincing. In, if, you, if you look into accessibility, there are specs online for how to make web pages accessible, and there are tags that you can put on elements, on DOM elements, and stuff like that. And it just didn't feel like it was enough, because it didn't feel like that could really, a, an app that was so rich, that had so many things going on all at once, that required such a visual field. I mean, you've all used spreadsheets, right? You, you kind of see everything all at once. And your col you know the column headers for the columns. You know the row headers for the rows. And so something that just like reads a cell value to you doesn't work. And the reason we know this is because we went through this exercise every week where we turned off our screens and we tried to use our product. It was the only way we could actually decide, figure out how to do this because none of us were blind and none of us had those needs. So how are we going to do this? And every week we'd sit down and we'd go, yeah, I did, I did the week. I checked in the code. It's accessible. This part, portion, this panel, this dialogue, it works. And then we would turn the screen off and try it. And it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is not usually because it wasn't reading anything. It's because we were saying too much or we were saying too little or there was some additional piece of information and context that we needed that once the screen was off, we didn't have, but we didn't realize that we didn't have it until we turned the screen off. 
Um, so, so my question to you is, in doing this and coming up with a set of principles, if the principle is that you should always do the uh, thing that the greatest number of users want, how do you ever get to the users that need internationalization or the users that uh, need screen readers and things like that? Is there an additional principle? What is the difference between those percentages? I have a percentage, I have 20% of users who want pivot tables. And I have 2% of users uh, who would use our accessibility features. How do I, on the basis of what principle do I put the 2% first? Yeah. What's right? So why is it right? What makes the two percent different? Playing devil's advocate, because obviously I agree with you. I did the project, but I also feel an obligation for the twenty percent of users who are infuriated because we don't have pivot tables, who can't use our product for the work that they do, for the for running their businesses. So what is it about about this that's different? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, in the interest of time, we'll get to this if we keep doing this, I promise you. But there are two things that came up when we were talking about this. One is Google has a, a, a value that conflicts with not doing this, which is that their mission is to make the world's information universally accessible and useful. If I have a product that's not accessible to a subset of users, is, it, pivot tables is a feature, but that's not that I, it's not information that can't be used by, by a set of users. So there's a little bit of tension there, for sure. And there's something else that occurred to me, which is, which is why I actually push back sometimes on the use of just data to say, well, this percentage of users want this feature and a smaller percentage of users want this feature. Because what is important is what defines those percentages. And in this particular case, you have one group of users for whom the need is based on a problem that they are trying to solve. And you have another set of users for whom the need is based on their personhood, on their, on their um, I don't want to say circumstance, that makes it sound like it's, it's a choice, but on, on, their, on their sort of uh, uncontrolled social, biological needs that, that are there um, through, through no fault of their own and through, through no cause of their own, potentially. So, so uh, that makes those two groups very different, in, in my view. And I would want to prioritize uh, the needs of, so, so if, you, if you have a, or at least I would propose that if you have a subgroup of users who can't use your product because of some uh, quality of their personhood, and it's a complicated world and it may take some creativity to think of this, certainly the accessibility is the easy one, but imagine race or uh, sex or wealth or what have you. Uh, it, may, it may be worth understanding which principle you're putting forth, uh, you're defending when you pick one over the other. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so I want to just uh, very quickly also, uh, it's hard to do this on your own and uh, as you've already seen, I, you can sort of short circuit this conversation to get at things that if you spent uh, a long time on your own, you would probably get to on your own. So if you need some inspiration, there are ethical frameworks that are already out there. I just wanted to mention them, so you can go look at them. Now, you, you don't actually, it turns out, need, need to really study them in depth to, for them to be useful for you in coming up with your own set of values. But religion um, is, um, I will admit, I'm not religious at all. But it is interesting, when I've spent so many years studying philosophy, you kind of see religion differently. Because it turns out that, uh, and this is cheating a little bit on this list, because deontological ethics, what, uh, Dion is, I believe, Greek for duty. The, a deontological ethical framework is one that, that uh, identifies a set of inviolable rules, which religion also is. Uh, it, religion is a deontological ethical framework. I just list them separately because usually when people talk about this, they're talking about someone like Kant. And when they're talking about religion, they're talking about religion. So I like to split them up. Um, utilitarianism uh, is basically a form of consequentialism. Engineers tend to really like utilitarianism to begin with. And so do CEOs, uh, business people in general, marketing people, because it's very quantifiable and it feels like you are not biased. Uh, the idea with utilitarianism is essentially that it is the greatest good for the greatest number. And Jeremy Bentham, uh, when he proposed it, literally perceived it as a mathematical calculation, uh, that we would calculate sort of happiness points and sadness points, and we would, taking all 
consequences of an action into consideration. We'd put them all into a machine and we'd add it all up and we would see what the result is. This is kind of what it feels like when a company doesn't want to recall uh, a car defect because they look at the number of dollars that they would have to pay out times the number of uh, accidents that, that would happen and they decide, well, that, that's cheaper than recalling so we won't recall. Um, utilitarians will tell you, rightfully so, that that is not the right way to do utilitarianism. True. But doing real utilitarianism is hard because you have to take into account in your calculation all the consequences, which is very hard to do. And if you need to make a snap judgment on something, if you need to get into a really crowded subway train, or you need to give someone a seat, and you're trying to do utilitarian calculation, I can tell you, I've tried to do this, it's kind of exhausting. So, um, but it is, it is a framework that can work sometimes. I'll tell you situations where utilitarianism works really nicely is if you want to buy yourself a really expensive pair of boots and you consider that, this is Peter Singer's article in the New York Times, where you said if you were to cross, uh, uh, to go by, if you were wearing your fancy boots and you were to go by a lake and there was a drowning child, would you jump in and ruin your boots and rescue the child? Well, presumably you would. Well, then why would you buy the boots and not just, why would you, uh, in that case, not buy the boots and donate your money to an organization that would save children? Um, and virtue ethics is Aristotle, which is the oldest, 350 BC, and now there's a resurgence in virtue ethics for a very good reason. Virtue ethics focuses the question not on whether or not the act itself is good or bad, or you should per be permitted to do it, but on the development of your moral character. Flips the question back onto, onto us. And in, so the, the, the way of doing it is, um, you know, uh, you might ask yourself on the subway, well, should I give, you know, there's, there's, there's someone who, who, you know, for whatever reason, someone's pregnant or old or whatever, and I'm considering giving up my seat. Well, am I obligated to give up my seat? No. Am I the kind of person, do I want to be the kind of person who would give up a seat? Maybe. Uh, probably. I hope. So virtue ethics, I think, is very interesting because it flips the question of what you would do back onto yourself. Or in the case of a group or an organization, are you the kind of company that does X, Y, Z? Uh, in, in, I mean, I don't want to pick on any companies, but you know, Uber's mission statement is to make, it's something like making transportation like water. And I think they've probably, you know, that's what they do. So these other things that you might get upset with them about, I don't know, it doesn't really conflict with their mission statement. I don't know that it conflicts with any of the values statements that they've put out. It matters. Um, so you might want to uh, take, so all of these can serve as inspiration for you when you're trying to come up with uh, a framework that works for you or your organization. I wanted to very quickly mention, do we still have a minute or two? Okay. Uh, that there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of interesting experiments about human behavior and how you get people to behave better or worse. Uh, it, it's either really depressing or really encouraging depending on, on your take. It turns out it's not that hard to get people to, to be mean to each other. It's also not that hard to get people to be nice to each other. Um, but two things that do tend to work. Uh, uh, and I can talk about this later or, or when we get into it, but there's, there's a famous set of experiments called the Milgram experiments where they got people to, um, who believed, uh, they got people to believe they were electrocuting other participants to the point of, of death, 450 volts or whatever it is, where they got 65% of participants to go along with the electrocution, to, to actually flip the switches and do the electrocution. Um, and there's another really interesting set of experiments where they had people assign tasks that were desirable and undesirable uh, in various circumstances, giving them coins to flip and doing things like that, and then seeing if those people were honest with themselves and with the participants about how they assigned the tasks. And in both cases, there were the Milgram experiments uh, actually are somewhat misunderstood. Um, there were s versions of the experiment that were done where people did refuse to do the electrocution. Uh, and there were also variations on the coin flip, on, on the task attribution experiment, where people were very honest about how they assigned the tasks. And the big difference in the Milgram experiment was that when they asked people to go through the mental exercise of identifying with the subject and to think about the things that, they, that would put them at a distance with the, exper the person running the experiment, um, they were more likely to not uh, electrocute the subject. Um, so, if, and ideologically speaking, uh, the people who were most likely to do it were ones who felt very connected to the idea of science, that science is good. Uh, it turns out that Milgram spent, uh, talked to them beforehand, told them that the experiment was very important, that there are not a lot of experiments that are like this, that, have, that will give us these results, and we really need these results, and so on and so forth. So these people felt like they were a part of something. They felt like they were ideologically aligned with the experimenter, and that is why they actually did it. It turns out the version of the experiment where they just told people, they just said, you have no choice, you have to electrocute this person. 
they, uh, that almost goes to zero. People don't want to follow orders. And if you try to just tell people what to do, they'll get pissed off. Um, it's getting people aligned with your vision uh, and, and your ideology in a way that is believable that gets them to do all sorts of things. Um, so if, you get your, if you're uh, in a situation where you need to, I, um, uh, uh, the, a way to use this is to do exactly what we did for accessibility. How did we identify with users who, uh, who couldn't see? We turned off our screens. That created an emotional awareness for us of how helpless it felt to, to, to suddenly use something that we made was accessible, but it was still kind of not useful, and it was really frustrating, and it made us angry, and we needed to fix it. And we identified with the user. Rather than identifying with the developers, who we were before we, we turned the screens off, which were just developers who felt like we just had to do this, that we didn't, this wasn't a feature that, uh, a part of the product or an interface of the product that we were going to use or that we understood, and we just felt like we were doing it through process um, or to check off boxes. And uh, this other thing, you believe you're being watched, uh, does turn out there are a lot of experiments where they do things like they put uh, eyes, uh, cutouts of, of eyes that, that watch you, uh, or you feel like you're being watched, or they put mirrors in, in rooms, and it turns out that people act morally, even when, they ha even when there's just a mirror hanging in the room, and it reflects back onto yourself. And I believe that this aligns with Aristotle's virtue ethics for me. Because when you, when the question is not what can I get away with or what am I obligated to do, but it becomes back to who am I? When I see myself in a mirror, I'm aware of myself not as the subject but as the object. And I think that that leads us, imagine yourself jamming into a subway car, okay, but imagine now the, the security camera and watch yourself jamming into the subway car. It's uncomfortable. I wouldn't want that video to be out there, right? And not everyone's really pissed off, and they're really uncomfortable, and I'm just still pushing in there because I just insist on it. Um, so these two things actually do very often uh, result in different outcomes. <clears throat> so this is the, the, the sort of recap, uh, and we'll wrap up. Uh, so everything we've gone through, I propose that you should not shy away from ethical decisions. It does take practice. And it does take a little bit of, of disconnecting from the emotional uh, uh, charge that many of you will have when you're thinking through some of these problems. Um, but you can still do it, uh, and you can do it well. Develop a, a, a normative ethical framework. Normative means just that you know, it's, it's, it's not a studying what people do naturally. It is coming up with uh, ideas of, of how people should behave. Uh, so um, if you take the time to come up with some set of normative ethics for yourself, and you go throughout the day, or, or a normative uh, set of ethics for your organization or engineering group, and you can use that to guide a lot of the decisions uh, that you have. Uh, have reason serve your ethical framework, not your whims. So be attuned to this, because it is what you do by default, I assure you. You make a choice, and then you work your way back. If you don't start with something else, that is what you'll do. The way to think about it is that reason, uh, another metaphor I like to use is uh, in a courtroom, you have, let's say you have a, uh, you know, two attorneys and a judge, all three are using reason. But the lawyers are operating under the idea that they have to use reason to serve their clients. Whether, the, whether it's good or bad doesn't matter. The judge is, is using a set of principles, maybe the Constitution, maybe something else, and saying, well, this is the thing that I need to defend. How, does, how do these arguments uh, um, intersect with that? And I will use reason to try to, to decide between them. Uh, testing and revising your ethical framework often uh, is it's doing exactly what we did here. Uh, and I would say, if you come up with a set of principles for your organization in your group, retest them and don't worry about uh, uh, changing them. Very often, I find that organizations or groups will come up with a set of values that are so loosey-goosey that you're like, well, that's, that's great. Like, always, let's, we'll work together, and, and let's be uh, really passionate and, um, and, and, you know, and really committed. Well, OK, like Nazi Germany also was all those things. Like, you need, you need to test your ethical principles, not just against the good things that they will lead to, but think of some crazy stuff and see if your principles would prevent you from doing the crazy stuff. And if not, then think about why. Uh, Identifying with others I've already covered. And I like this quote from Thomas Jefferson, which aligns with the experiment that I described, which I can tell you about in more detail later. But whenever you do a thing, act as if all the world were watching. Turns out that's not such a bad way to go about if you want to ignore everything else that I said in this talk, and you do that, it might not be that bad. Um, so I think that is it.
we'll give you 20 seconds to do that. So <laughs> jumping up and down during Q&A. Giving it to them yet? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, let's, uh, let's start QA. Um, raise your hands, uh, and I'll send this off to the first person. Oh, I'm I, yeah. All right, well, he's close to you. Let's start with that. Uh, hey, thanks for uh, the talk. It was super sure. informative, definitely uh, thought provoking. Mm -hmm. um, just on like a practical note, like, um, I really like the algorithm that you presented. Just how would we actually go about practically thinking about this? Is it like sit in your room for an hour and form up some questions and write it down? Or like what, what, is the act, like what would you suggest as a way to actually start thinking about an ethical framework? Uh, and do you mean specifically for software engineering or just in, in life? No, I mean like a, li like a life. In life. In life uh, well, I mean, they're not, they're not necessarily that different, but you have to work with others if you're doing right, it right. as part of an organization. And I guess as a second question, like yeah. as a team, how would you also do that, you know? Um, so, so I've personally just done my own little experiments as I've studied these, the, the, the different schools that, uh, the ethical frameworks that I had up before, where I sort of walked around and I said, well, let me kind of be a utilitarian and see how that works out for me. And let me, let me try to be a, uh, more of a Kantian today and see how that works. Um, uh, I found that, uh, at least for me, utilitarianism was a way to, I, I felt like I could always tweak the knobs just a little bit too easily in my favor. So it was too easy to be a bad utilitarian, um, in, for me at least. Uh, but um, I, I think for the most part, uh, you know, you don't need to employ this stuff every minute of every day. Um, but I do think that it's interesting and I find it helpful to employ it in, in the small things that you run into. Um, like, uh, you know, most of us are not doing doing things that that uh, hopefully are are that consequential. But yeah, giving up a seat on the subway, or you know, taking some stationery from the office, or whatever it is. I found that when I held, it's true. I found that when I held myself to to a higher standard in those things, it would tend to result in other behavior that really mattered, um, that would come up less frequently. But maybe in a personal relationship, you know, someone. Uh, might have invited me to a party that I didn't want to go to, and I normally might have made up an excuse and, and lied, and, and, and I found myself that when I was sort of in the habit of, of not doing the, uh, these other things, that I would uh, tend to be more honest and just say, I, I don't really want to go to the party or you know, whatever it is, um, or I'm really tired, instead of just saying, oh, I already have plans with someone else, and that's totally not true, and I just made that up. Um, now, uh, it, I really do think that for the most part in the small decisions, we do know what's right and wrong, but it is being in the mindset of caring about this. It's sort of like exercising. Um, when you're in a mindset of exercising, you're also eating better, you tend to sleep better. There's, like a, there's a whole constellation of things that happen. And I find that when I'm uh, sitting around thinking about these philosophical questions, uh, then um, the other things tend to, to fall out. So I don't, so the reason I'm saying this is because I don't feel like you need to constantly pull out a piece of paper and go, oh, of the 10, 10 rules that I came up today, am I violating any of them in this very moment? You just kind of know for the most part. Um, but I think it is worth understanding whether or not you tend towards some set of rules that are inviolable. And, I, and for me, I did sort of cement a set of rules. The one I mentioned before is, it, the, the lying one was interesting because after I, I read a bunch of content, I said, that's interesting. What if I just really never lied? At, like really no lying at all ever. No, no gray, no white lies, no anything. Um, it turns out it is possible to do it, but there are a lot of situations where you have to think really creatively on how to not lie. Um, and that might feel, that might sound really bad, but it's not because sometimes it turns out you just don't have to say anything. That's a thing. <laughs> you can just not say anything. It's great. You feel compelled to say something because you have compassion. You say, oh, OK. You kind of know you're expected to say something, but I just don't say anything now. And it's great. And I feel like I haven't lied or, or done anything. So sorry, it's a bit of a rambling answer. Um, uh, to be honest, there isn't a concrete set of you know, these seven steps to developing your framework. Beyond doing that, I do think it's important 
to, if, if I did come across a situation where I felt like it really was necessary to lie, I would ask myself why and try to develop a corollary to it and say, well, I don't lie except, you know, I don't know, some, some situation where it really is, makes a lot of sense to just lie. A murderer is at the door, you know, and wants to find someone, uh, and I'm hiding them. Um, do you that, think, like, yeah, and like as a team as well, like how would you go about that? Maybe the, 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 the nice thing about a team is that we have this culture of, of coming up with values and mission statements and all this stuff. So it doesn't sound, it almost sounds a little bit more perverse to say, well, last night I sat down and I came up with my own moral, you know, ethical framework than it does to say, well, this week we're going to come up with a set of a mission statement and our values. So in a way, you have this opportunity with your team to come up with something, and I think it's pretty acceptable to do that. Uh, and, and really, uh, so I don't, I, I, depending on your team, I, I can't imagine that your team would really push back on that too much. Um, but I think that a lot of times people do a very bad job of it because they don't test the values that they come up with and try to poke holes in them by coming up with crazy situations that their values would still uh, allow. They just take values and make them feel good about themselves and say, well, those are our values. You know, we want to be passionate and do great stuff and make the world a better place and all this stuff. And okay, that's, that's, that's pretty easy to say about almost everything and everyone. Um, so you need a little more. Uh, yeah, you're right next. Sorry, we'll, we'll make it to, to, I'll pick someone from the other side next. Yep. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, sure. So I guess sort of a two-part question. Um, it seems to me that Google like, has always presented sort of um, an image that ethical behavior is important to the company, mm. like the do no evil or, you know. Yep. Um, and um, I guess, so one, Actually, do you don't be evil. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, important. Which is, no, and I'm yeah. sorry. I, I don't, yeah. It's not to be nitpicky. Yeah. It's because it, it flips the... It, it, it again does what I said before, where it flips it back onto you. Instead of saying this act is not okay, it's, it's who are you as an organization or as a person. And I think to me it makes mm. a little bit of a difference. But sorry, right. I didn't interrupt you. Um, so do you find yourself um, quite often, like is, does this happen a lot on your team or in Google in general where you're checking back with Google's ethical framework? That's A. B, because you've obviously studied philosophy, was that one of the reasons you, that attracted you towards working towards a, oh, like Google? Good question. Um, so um, the second one's easier to answer because I've been at Google for 10 years, yeah. and I came to philosophy after I started at Google. Oh, uh, so, so, um, so that wasn't the reason I went to Google. Uh, and I, I, for whatever reason, uh, my, at least my team, the people that I've interacted with at Google, I've, I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, I trust all of them. And uh, as an organization, it's, it's been... Uh, it's incredible the safeguards that are in place, both culturally and legally and process-wise, that, pr that protect things like user data. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and I have, yeah, I've never really run into anything that I, that I felt uh, was, was problematic at all. And in fact, I've, the judgment has always been spot on in my view. Um, I'm trying to think if there were things that, that we messed up. Um, Nothing, nothing on sheets that I can remember. Um, yeah, no, for, no. For the most part, the, the the values have really been there. I don't know that it, that they've been there. Be, I, I will say that the the there's not this feeling in the organization at all. At least, at least in my personal experience, that people are are a means in any way. This is so uh, one of Kant's deontological principles is that you never treat a person as a means, always as an end, um, which in the business world can be hard to do. Uh, to never treat people as a means. But um, at least in everything that I've ever done there or been asked to do, it's been the case that we always treated users with dignity and their data with respect. Uh, and, and thankfully, I've never been asked to, to, to do anything that I felt was, was in otherwise. And sometimes I just didn't really even think about things, and suddenly I discovered that there's some really complicated process. I'm like, oh, that's amazing that we have that process. Otherwise, people would be able to do X, Y, Z, and they can't, and that's awesome. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, before I pass on the yeah. mic quickly, for anyone that's interested in like that whole ethical uh, debate earlier, I, um, there's like an amazing radio lab. Oh, cool! Uh, on this in in Katrina in New Orleans, when one of the hospitals lost power and they had to start making decisions about who was going to live and who was going to die. Oh God, that's all. And it's that in real life, <laughs> and it's really worth checking out. So, thank you. Radio lab. Radio lab. You just go to their um, their podcast. Okay. I think it was last year, but it's like it's haunting, but it makes you realize. These are decisions that people have to make sometimes, yeah. and they're impossible decisions, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll pick someone on on this side. S sorry, anyone? Okay. Uh, just a question. You talk about ethical framework. 
do you think we can train machine to make that decision, like self-driving driving cars? Like when a car makes decision like which, which direction to go, kill one person or five, and the car decided to make decision to kill that one person, and who's gonna take the responsibility of that person? So far, from everything that I've seen and everything that I've studied and read, uh, it seems that uh, if anything, machines are not helping us come up with more ethical decisions. They are reflecting back onto us our own biases and, and weaknesses and inability to decide things. Uh, so, you know, I, I always, um, you know, fake news is a good example. If you take a machine learning algorithm and have it decide what kind of content it's going to show people on, if, if you have some sort of a, a video site and a social media site, it's not going to be a great experience. Uh, the machine learning algorithm will come up with stuff that will compel, y it will be compelling. You will watch the videos, uh, you know, of, I don't know, cats fighting or, you know, it's just, my, just things that are uh, race car slamming into a wall. I don't know, awful things, engaging things, clickbait, terrible things. Um, but you're not going, that's not going to be an enriching experience. Uh, and it's very important when you're doing uh, things like machine learning that you're aware of the values that you put into the algorithm. So if I were to take an omniscient, omnipresent AI machine learning system and say, here's a transportation system. Make it so that everyone gets to, from point A to point B as fast as possible. Well, uh, I imagine that the optimum uh, answer that it would come up with would result in a large number of deaths. But if you lived, you would get from point A to point B super fast. Right? It's that kind of thing. Um, so it's not that hope is lost. I think we're learning how to do that. I think it's been kind of interesting to see how we stumble as we ask computers to give us answers, and they give us answers that we find unpalatable, and then we realize, oh, yeah, you're a machine, and I need to tell you that life is important. Um, uh, so I don't, so far I haven't seen anything uh, where, I think it's going to continue to be the big differentiating feature between, uh, feature between machines and AI and all that stuff and human consciousness. It's just that uh, humanity and dignity is something that we, we can only tell machines to respect. I don't think that we can get them to really come up with it on their own uh, and figure it out uh, unless, unless we tell them to. But we can tell them to, so you know, it's okay. I'm not saying we shouldn't do machine learning. Um, yeah. And, uh, in the, right in the back. Um, my question, um, I guess it's the subject of shame and the role shame plays in sort of enforcing or monitoring ethical systems. Um, one thing that concerns me right now is um, people's rights to privacy and, and what, and the sort of very hazy ideas of like what belongs to who. Um, and I know for a lot of people, the idea of being watched, um, particularly uh, community, like different minority communities who feel, you know, under surveillance, um, the act of being watched can mean something very different. And it's not so much, you know, checking to see whether or not I am upholding my own standards of mm -hmm. ethics, but am I adhering to this greater system of ethics that I find oppressive or that people in my community yeah. find oppressive. So how do, how do we sort of reconcile that, these sort of differences of power in various communities, um, and also what sort of role might technology play in either sort of using shame? And I know if you're, saying using Twitter and you're making a tweet, like you have to keep in mind that millions of people are going to have access to this tweet. Right. But if you're browsing the internet, um, are you supposed to keep in mind that your data is, might be available unbeknownst to you, and how is this supposed to sort of change the way we interact with technology? Um, so the one thing I want to point out is that the, the comments that I made in the presentation about using this idea of being watched um, is uh, not, I don't want that to be conflated with the idea of, you know, that, that um, uh, Google or Facebook, or th that's a different kind of watching, and the, the oppressive uh, uh, nature of, of, of content online, personal content online, personal information online, uh, being available to people. Uh, that's not the spirit in which I meant that. I just meant uh, that in the spirit of, um, uh, like I said before, you know, you're on the subway and you do something, and imagine someone just looking, or imagine someone else seeing that, your friends seeing that, your family seeing that, other people seeing that. Now, uh, shame is a complicated subject. I do think that we, uh, the, 
the thing that comes to mind about it is that uh, we feel shame for lots of different reasons, and I think identifying situations where society isn't, we feel comfortable in our behavior, but we know that it's not exactly aligned with expectations either in society broadly or within certain circles. Um, I personally uh, push back on the feelings of shame and say, okay, I recognize that I grew up in this kind of society, I'm going to feel certain things, but I can also say that uh, that's just a byproduct and that I don't actually agree with what shame is trying to tell me. So shame to me is a signifier. Um, it, is not the, it is not the conclusion. If I just walked around and didn't do anything that I ever felt shame, shame about, I, I don't know, my life would probably be a lot more boring than it is now. But like, I, would, I, I feel like there are times where you, your behavior is fine for you and your values and your friends and your family and the people who care about you, but other people have different value systems. And like you said, you might live in a society where that's the case. Um, but that's why it's so important to think about this stuff and to understand how you work your way back from shame and say, well, why, why is it okay that I'm doing this even though there's, there's this, this feeling that I shouldn't be? And if you work your way back and you come back to something that you feel really grounded in, then at least for me, that's satisfying. And I say, okay, I, I, can, I find this defensible in a consistent way with everything else that I find defensible. Uh, is that a yes, somewhat helpful answer? Okay. Uh, yes. Um, so my question is, thank you, by the way, for the talk. My question is, um, when you're developing, uh, I'm specifically gearing this towards um, products in like the health industry, okay? Oh, yeah. And if you're developing some sort of uh, framework or some sort of product, and your initial end goal is to create a product that's saving lives, right? But in your development, you have to face a trade-off between, do I come up with a product that in the long run is going to save a large amount of lives? versus can I come up with a product as fast as possible to save lives immediately? How would you look at that sort of situation? Because obviously, like, um, in your presentation, when you covered that you're identifying with people, at yeah. least personally speaking, if I was somebody that, you know, this product is being developed for, I would want, you know, the company developing it for me to consider other people and, like, all the other people that they would save later on. Say you're sa saving 90% of people later on, if you take the, this extra year versus 50%, but then you don't get to these like other people for many more years to come. So when you're developing that product, how do you how do you deal with that trade-off? I think this this one I would be unable to to, to think about outside of an act. I, this is one of the, I mean as a thought experiment, that's almost impossible. I, I can't. I, I'm I'm stuck. Um, and this is one of those things where we talked about before that real life there's kind of a gray. So I would look at uh, you know, why is it, whatever it is that I'm planning on doing for the longer term patients, are there other uh, externalities that might assist? So in the time when I'm racing for the patients who need it more urgently, are there other efforts that are happening that might help with the patients in the longer term? That might be one thing to think about. Um, there is an immediacy uh, that resonates with me to, to, to saving lives that would, that in my gut instinct would, would probably push me in that direction, but I would have to align it with, some, with something, uh, or, or I, I would sit down and really think through uh, what principles um, uh, each of those scenarios aligns with and all of the details. The details really do matter, I think, in an example like this. Yeah, I, I asked this specific question because it, it's like a very- Does it exist? It's, no, it's just a very like, um, advanced like version of like a dilemma that somebody could have like right now like obviously when we're dealing with saving lives it's much more difficult to think about but like as you get further and further away from that when you are having an impact on people's lives you mentioned like a transportation system for example yep when you're having that impact like at what point do you start to like sit down and really question your um, question your ethics versus just but trusting that your ethical application is going to be the most valid yeah, um, I think time is not uh, time is an interesting element to bring into these thought experiments. And often, what we do is that the more the, the the longer out we think, the more we assume that we don't have enough information to make an informed decision. So I can I, I usually will feel like I can make a more informed decision about some an act that I'm going to take that uh, an act that I will carry out next week uh, compared to an act that I will carry out three years from now. And I think that that makes sense. I think there's a reason that we, that we feel that way. And that should, in my, in my view, for me, that would weigh into the decisions pretty strongly. Um, 
because I, God, how heartbreaking would it be to plan out for something longer term to have made that trade off and then for some set of circumstances to change. Um, but again, it also depends on, on how strongly I assume that whatever, the problem with things far out is I don't know yet if it will work, presumably until it happens. And that's also a risk factor, right? Depending on what you're talking about specifically. Yeah. Uh, yes, with the hat. So one of your points is to have us challenge or to engage in ethics questions, correct? Yep. Um, so my question to you is why are you promoting for all of us to do this when you don't know what our ethical standards are? Are you, are you worried or scared to have everybody who you don't know what their knowledge base, what their ethical foundations are, mm. and then tell them to go and ask, question um, ethics? Good question. So uh, actually, the, the reason I think this is so important is because you're all doing this anyway. Uh, you are making choices. You're building software. You're voting. You're participating in society. You're making decisions every single day. So I don't think that people aren't making ethical choices. Ha if you live, you're making ethical choices. Now, if you're making them on the basis of, of some arbitrary whim, or usually, uh, to be honest, the way it tends to work uh, from the research is that we're doing the things that the people around us do. Uh, and we do the things that we were raised to do, for the most part. Uh, and, and so if that's the only way in which we're operating, it turns out our society, I mean, we're, we all get along reasonably well. You know, we're a functioning society. We're OK. Um, but as technologists who are uh, creating things that scale, uh, the impact of our decision is not just in our, in our home and in our family and with our friends. It's, it's uh, in some of these companies, it's millions and millions of people uh, that you're going to affect. And so my concern is not, I don't, I don't think I'm encouraging people to engage in ethical uh, decisions that they would necessarily not be making otherwise. What I, what I believe I'm doing is saying, you're probably making these choices anyway. Think about how you're doing it and adopt a different algorithm, essentially, for, for going through with it, which is to say, instead of coming up, instead of, um, and not to kick a, a, a dead horse, so to speak, but instead of walking into a, uh, a decision that you've already determined is, is the one that you want and then working your way back, uh, prod it, question it, try to poke holes in your own decision and see if you can come up with something that's grounded in, in more than just that's what you felt like when you started. Uh, and, and I do think it's really important uh, that, we, that we do that, that we're better ethicists, essentially. And, and also, we're very bad at doing this. Um, this is kind of a, a bit of a tangent. But it turns out that alone, we're very bad at this. Uh, so one, one thing is, and I should have said this before, if you sit in a room by yourself and try to come up with a bunch of principles, you will probably come up with, with not that great uh, a set of principles, to be honest. It is in the engagement with other people that they're most often challenged. And moreover, it tends to be in the in-person engagement because of all of the nonverbal communication and empathy that we tend to have when we are face to face with each other. So unfortunately, I don't think Facebook is a great place, for instance, to develop a set of ethical frameworks. It's a, it's a great place to get angry about someone else's ethical framework. But, uh, but, and, and the reason is that there's uh, such a, a lack of nonverbal communication there uh, that you really just get text, it turns out, is actually the, the very minor part of what you communicate to another human being when you're face to face. It's very hard to get quite as angry with another human if you're collaborating face to face uh, on, on problems of ethics, as opposed to a divorced medium, uh, online chat, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. So that's a tangent, but I think it's an important one. Time for one more question. Okay. Yes. How would you apply fear factors to ethics, especially in business sense? Let's say like, um, you have to value to deliver. Your team has to value to deliver. You have to deliver a project on a certain time. And um, you maybe have to reverse engineer or still some parts of software of others, reverse engineer, and like in, in better than your code. Same, like, same as in a combat. You, know, you have to go. You have to deliver. You have to perform a task. You have to bring your unit back in terms. And, you know, how, how would you int like, integrate the fear factor? with ethics, that you not are going to perform the task or finish it. So when you say fear factor, you mean, you mean the fear of, of not, uh, I'm sorry, not of not delivering. 
So are you saying that when you're compelled to sort of take shortcuts or do things, you said reverse engineering uh, other people's products or things like that? Um, I mean, it's probably not a surprise. I don't, I, I, I don't think that um, <laughs> fear like shame might be a good sign of something, but it is a really terrible, uh, uh, I think, uh, base um, motivator. Uh, unless, I mean, look, the kind of fear you're talking about is different from the kind of fear you'd feel running from a burning building or something, right? So let's, let's be clear. Um, but I think it's important. The, the, the real test of, of your uh, ethics comes not when, when things are great. Uh, it comes when you have to really make hard choices because you're going to make less money, you're not going to launch something on time, your competitors are going to beat you. Uh, when things are good, ethics is easy because, because we all, uh, uh, we, there's, there's no um, sense of, uh, of lack. There's no sense of, of risk. There's just uh, greed, I guess, in those, in those situations. But when, when you really are uh, feeling uh, like you have something to lose, uh, whether or not you stick to your principles, um, is a good test of, of, I think, your, your ethical framework. And also, sometimes you may feel compelled to do something. I'm, um, not every act is a moral or an immoral act. So when I leave my apartment, if I decide to go left or right, doesn't, that's not a moral question. I just, so not every decision has to be that. And also there are acts for which um, the, an understandable act is, is not a moral one, but we still might understand why someone does it. So you know, imagine something in a movie where, uh, I don't know, someone holds a gun to someone's head and says, open the safe, right? So the criminal says, open the safe. And, and the person gives in and opens the safe. It's not a moral act. Uh, it's not an immoral act. Uh, we all understand why that would happen. But imagine if the person said, absolutely not. I will you know, I'm, this is my job. I guard this safe. You can shoot me in the head, and I will not give you the combination. Like, good for him, in a way. I'm, and if maybe you think that's ridiculous, <laughs> swap the safe out with like, a, a different person. Uh, you know, maybe maybe the, it's not a safe, but it's risking someone else's life, right? And they say, well, I'm not going to hurt that person just to save myself, so I'm not doing this, right? We would, we would say that's a moral person, right? We would hold that uh, person in high regard. Um, if the person didn't have the wherewithal to do that, we would understand it, but we would hope that we would be better. Um, so, you know, none of us are perfect, and there are times where we're going to do things. I think the best that we can do is to look at those situations. After the fact, very often we can look back when we're not in the heat of the moment and say, you know, we, we really, we, we took a shortcut there. We weren't the best version of ourselves. We can do better. And that's probably, if you ever find yourself in a situation where that's what happens, I would hope that you would take time to reflect. That would be the best I could hope for. If you found yourself just making that choice, take the time afterwards, reflect, iterate, and, and then uh, hopefully the next time around you can stick to your principles. Cool.